Well, here we are again, and we're all ready to go. So come on in and make yourself at home. All right, well here we are again with another episode of JP Gun Vault. I'm having a good time, I hope you are. I hope I'm not boring you. I know it's been of interest to me. Uh, let's talk about another, or another 1911. In episode 10, you remember I talked about quite a smattering of them here, and I brought one of those back here in particular, and this is a less Bear pistol I have. I actually won this pistol. <laughs> Probably the most expensive thing I ever won. And a, kind of an interesting story because it really had a lot to do with where I went in the industry and how I, how I thought about things at the time. I was at the 1994 Single Stack Classic. If you people have been involved in competitive shooting, uh, you might have remembered there was that transitional period where people started to shoot high cap uh, semi-autos. And it was a lot of people that kind of resented that and wanted to keep things down to the the where they were with single stack type 1911s and so there was this demand for that kind of an event or a division because obviously when high cap came out well you were no longer competitive with one of these things and we didn't have the divisions back then so Springfield Armory, uh, Robbie Latham uh, a number of people got behind this movement and they came up with this event called the single stack classic and the first one was in the Quad City in 1994, and I went to uh, shoot that. I remember I, I, uh, I squatted up with uh, Frank Garcia, so that was kind of fun to shoot with another pro when I could kind of take a, take a listen and see what he was doing and learn from him too. Another great instructor, he's got a school down in Florida. But I was shooting a, a Colt type 1911 I had at the time, and uh, at the end of the match, I realized I'd done pretty well. I was an A-class shooter, and I ended up winning that division, but more importantly, I was 13th overall, and 13th overall put me right at the tail end of all of the big name shooters at the time, the real professionals. Felt pretty good about that. Now, as it so happened, they had a really deep price table. More guns than a price table than I think I'd ever seen up to that point, but they had 13 custom pistols by various well-known custom pistol manufacturers. And one of them was a Les Bear, this pistol. Now, interestingly enough, the other 12 guns that were on the table were all what I would consider carry configurations with fixed sights. They really were not competition pistols. They were really more like exotic carry guns. But the Les Bear, in fact, I, get, I really kind of forget what he called this pistol, but it had an ambi safety, it had uh, an adjustable rear sight, not these sights, we'll go into that in a second here, but it had, it was set up, it had a Bomar rear, it was set up just the way I wanted it for an all out single stack competition pistol. And I thought to myself, well, that thing will never be on the table by the time I get to it, because after the match, I was, we were all up there looking at the prize table, and I saw that pistol, and I thought, that's the one I want. And I said, well, it'll never be there. Well, lo and behold, when he went through the prize line, and I, I came up there, well, this pistol was still sitting there. And I, I thought, what, what the heck? How could, why would this, why would, and this is one of the, you know, I thought the more fully configured pistols there, why would no one want this pistol? And I asked one of the other, uh, one of the other pros there, I says, well, why did no one take that pistol? And he says, ah, because we're, we're upset with Les Bear. I said, well, why is that? Because he's collapsed the pricing structure on these guns, because this thing was at the time under $2,000, and all these other pistols were up there close to $3,000. And uh, it just so happened that uh, I was sponsoring the event, and I was working a table, you know, when I could, and I was working a table right next to Les Bear. So uh, I got talking to Les, and, and I thought, well, I knew that he had really established himself in terms of building these pistols, uh, and he really had a network of, 
of uh, dealers out there, so he was very successful doing this. And I had this idea about the AR type rifle and I really wanted to be able to build a custom quality rifle on a, what I would call, semi-production basis so that it was reproducible in the quality aspect of every part of it. You know, so this consistency was after. Because if you know anything about this type of stuff, you realize that if you buy a custom pistol from a custom gunsmith, everyone has got his own personality, all right? And I really was after more of a consistency through the way. So we knew that the performance aspect of every firearm was gonna be very consistent. And so I really thought we were gonna have one guy doing nothing but triggers, another guy doing building uppers. That was kind of my model. So I got talking less about this and lo and behold, that was exactly his manufacturing model. So then I knew that I was on the right path. Now, Les has been very successful at this. And interesting too that he actually got into building high quality ARs. And we were doing this, and of course we were like the first company out there to crack that $2,000 price bracket on, a, uh, on an AR type rifle. And the dealers thought I was crazy. Now, granted, we were selling those you know, direct, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the shipping to the FFL of the customer's choice, but I couldn't get any dealers to stock our rifles. And so when Les came out with his rifles and they were over, they met and, and uh, uh, went beyond that $2,000 price bracket, I have to give Les Bear credit for actually reestablishing, breaking that ceiling so all of a sudden the dealers realized that people were willing to spend that kind of money on a high quality rifle and we benefited from it uh, a great deal. So I want to say thanks to Les Bear for that. <laughs> So, so that, that is one of the stories behind this pistol. You notice these crazy looking sights it has on it. Well, one night, about four in the morning, I woke up, and of course this was that point in my life where I was starting to lose my, my visual acuity, and anybody that's in their 40s can start to relate to that. And I started having trouble seeing my iron sighted pistols and being able to shoot those as well as I did. And I woke up with this flash in the middle of the night about this sight system. And this, this really came from the fact that I was, had my teeth cut shooting a small bore competition with a precision 22 rimfire rifles that had globe type front sights and rear apertures. And I said, why wouldn't I use that on my pistol? So I came up with this double ring sight concept. You can see that it's got a tubular front sight and an aperture rear, really kind of the same concept. And, and I was just amazed at the level of accuracy I was able to achieve. I could pick rocks out of a 25-yard berm with this setup. And uh, they were, you know, certainly as fast as anything else I, I had shot. And so uh, I converted this pistol. It's got these double rank sights. And it's funny thing is you have these epiphany moments. And I thought, I, I, next morning I caught my wife and I said, hey, we're going to put our kids through college with this idea. Well, you know, shortly after that, fiber optic sights came out. And well, it kind of obsoleted this idea for me. <laughs> but, but we did sell it for many years. And it just goes to also to show like the, the cycle of, of products over time where something may be relevant and all of a sudden it is irrelevant. But still a great idea at the time. And I've got a number of pistols that I still keep set up with these, with these sites. You know, there's one other story that revolves around this pistol and that match in that era. And uh, one night after the match, was over you know, for the shooting for the day. And it was kind of towards dusk and I was walking, they had a 300 yard high power range just up the road a little bit and I, I heard some crazy noise up there. So I walked up the road and here was Mark Krebs. This is the first time I'd met him. Mark Krebs from Krebs Custom and he's been a close friend of mine for over the years. And at the time he was a great pistol smith. I mean, a lot of people thought he built one of the best uh, 1911 singles and you know high cap pistols out there. So Mark was sitting there and he had this Smith and Wesson Smith and Wesson 210 uh, uh, tear gas type uh, launcher, which is really a 37 millimeter tube on an end frame revolver uh, framework. And he had all these empty uh, 37 millimeter cartridges. Then he was like just trying to decide how much black powder he was putting black powder in them with a little scoop. And he had these projectiles that he'd made up. He'd turned them out of wood. They were actually individually turned on a lathe out of wood. And they had a kind of a steel bolt going down the center of them to, to uh, keep, uh, keep it all together. 
And so he kept upping the charge on this thing, and they would just kind of bloop, and they'd land about 25 yards in front of him. And, and, uh, and I'm watching him, and finally there was, I said, hey, Mark, I said, give me one of those things. And so there was a puddle of water from a rainstorm during the day, and I grabbed one of these wood projectiles, and I threw it in the water <laughs> and left it there for about 45 seconds or so. And I pulled it out and shook it off, and I said, try this. And so he put uh, he put about twenty grains of uh, of triple F in this case and shoved this thing in there, and when he let that fly, it went boom, and I saw that projectile go out there almost to the three hundred yard line because all he was missing was enough compression to really get that powder going and take advantage of it, and that that was the, that's how I marked, met uh, Mark Krebs, and it's interesting to note that he decided to give up building 1911s and went on to specializing in the uh, the AK platform and really became kind of what we are to the AR, uh, Mark Krebs came, became uh, that uh, really building really high grade, high performance AK type rifle. So I reach out to Mark Krebs, it's been great to know you too. So that covers what I wanted to say on today's episode. Now stay tuned for another episode of JP Gunvolt.